it assumes that the risks in a portfolio are independent random variables with finite mean and variance. Uh, now, when we say that it considers the sum of a large number of random variables, what we imply here is that it might be large, but we know exactly how many, right? So that amount there is fixed. It is a constant. It is not supposed to be uh, some random number, some random amount, okay? So all these are the features of the model of individual risks. Now, there is, there is an alternative to the model of individual risks. It is the model of collective risks, okay? Now, uh, in here, I ask you to go to take a look at uh, the Rolls paper. It is a rather old paper, but to, to be completely honest, it is a fantastic uh, piece of work. So <clears throat> I would strongly advise you to, to, to take a look at uh, this research paper and read it thoroughly. Uh, actually, it was one of, uh, one of our main references for at least uh, one final examination in the past. So it is a rather good paper, okay? Now, uh, I, I did tell you this, that actually is we do it with uh, frequency and severity. So the main difference between the model of individual risks and the model of collective risks is a difference in the in the realm of uh, of, of the modeling, you see, of uh, of the conceptualization of the thing, because in the model of individual risks, as I just told you, well, we assume that we have a large number of risks, so we might have a thousand risks, ten thousand risks. 20,000 risks, a million risks, right? But we know for sure how many risks we're dealing with. In the model of collective risks though, the amount of uh, risks we're dealing with is a random variable. The result of that is that instead of working with uh, just one type of random variable, which we just uh, say we add uh, gamma random variable plus another gamma random variable plus another random variable and so on uh, until we have reached the last one of you, right? In this case here, we just don't know that for sure. So the number of random variables we deal with is a uh, random variable itself. You see? You see? So it is just uh, typical, typical for us to use uh a couple of models a couple of random variables a random variable to model the frequency and a random variable to model the severity a random variable for frequency and a random variable to model the uh, severity now since the frequency is supposed to be uh, an integral number right then we will uh, always assume that the random variable for the frequency is a discrete type random variable. While for the case of the severity random variable, we'll just assume that we're dealing with a non-negative random variable. Now, the meaning of that is that, uh, well, in this case, what we have is a random variable supported on zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, right? And in this case, we'll be dealing with a random variable which can be uh, of real type, of integral type, it doesn't matter, right? Now, what really matters in here is that uh, you cannot have negative values in this random variable here. So it is just, uh, uh, it just makes no sense to use, for instance, the normal random variable in this case. So as you can see, from the very conception of the model of uh, collective risks, right? The central limit theorem is excluded. You see, why is that? Because you cannot use the normal random variable. That's why, okay? Now, it is just uh, typical to draw the histogram of the frequency 
the random variable uh, like this, and that the severity random variable looks more or less like this. The, the, the density function of the severity distribution looks more or less like this. This means that you're supposed to have a hump in here, right? And then a heavy right tail, right? Now, the reason for which you're supposed to have a heavy right tail is that, uh, well, you'd like to uh, take into consideration the, the large losses, right? But with a probability that is uh, not uh, small, you see? Now, this is the first result involved in the model of uh, collective risks. It says that, uh, well, if you mean to compute the expectation of uh, the random variable S, then that expectation will be given by the product of the, of the expectations of the parts of the model, right? So the expectation of X times the expectation of N. See, see? Now, the proof is rather straightforward. The proof is rather straightforward. All you have to do, all you have to do is to use the theorem of total probability. It is not difficult to see that, uh, well, in here we're just talking about an application, an application of the nested expectation theorem. What we have to do is to take the expectation of S as the expectation of the conditional expectation of S given N, okay? So since this thing here, oops, since this thing here is supposed to be a random variable itself, then we just have to take the expectation of that thing there, okay? Now, since the conditioning event is given by the random variable n, and we just said that the random variable n was supposed to be supported on the non-negative integers, then it is okay to use a sum there rather than, for instance, an integral. Now, as for the next part, well, just you're just supposed to write instead of an S, the sum of all these x's. Now I know, I know how this looks like. In here you're taking a random amount of random variables. Take a random amount of random variables because since we are conditioning to the event that n equals precisely lowercase n, then we can just substitute this n by this n right here. Now, of course, you might be entitled to ask, yeah, but what happened with this part here? What happened to this part here from this step to this step right here? Because I mean, the reminder of the expression is just the same. It's just that uh, I just decided to get rid of the conditioning part. So what happened there? Well, first of all, it happened that uh, I decided to set n equal to lowercase n. That's the first thing. Now, second, in the hypothesis of the model of collective risks, I also said that n is independent of the sequence of independent and identically, uh, identically distributed random variables x. So I, I know I'm using the word independent twice in here. I'm saying that n is independent of all these independent random variables. So the meaning of that is that these random variables are pairwise independent. So n is independent, n is independent of the sequence of independent random variables. You see? So since n, since n is independent of this sequence of random variables, then you can do things like this. So you can just get rid of this and write this. From this step to this step here, as you can see, as you can see, I just copied this sigma here to here. So that's just copy and paste, that's it. Expectation, expectation, probability, probability. Whoa, something odd in here. Something shady happened here. This is because they are identically distributed. 
So we could just write instead of this. And here I'm just skipping one step. You see, the step I'm skipping is this thing equals the sum over all n. You should uh, note how I say this, the sum over all n. So you just need to, to be aware of uh, how it's uh, properly said. Of the sum from one to n, you see? In here, allow me to write from i equal to one to n of the expectation of xi, like this, times the probability of n. And in here, allow me to just write n equal to zero to infinity. So as you can see, this sigma here is nested in this other sigma right here. You see? Because the indices, I mean, this index here depends on this index right here. Why is that? Because it goes all the way from one to n. So in this step, it's just uh, equal to zero. So that means that in that particular case, this is a void sum, so it's just a zero. But if we just start at n equal to one, then this sum here goes all the way from i equal to one to one. So it's just uh, one sum and expression. In the second case, that is when n equals two, then we go from i equal to one to two of the expectation of x one and x two, you see? So it's a two sum and expression, you see? Now, since all of this uh, excess and therefore their, uh, all of these excess are uh, identically distributed, their expectations are just the same. So it is safe to call them expectation of X without the I. So how many expectations have we in this thing here? N. So we have the expectation of the expectation of N X or N times the expectation of X times the probability of N. You can just take the expectation of X out of the Sigma so we can factor it. So we take the expectation out of the sum, you factor it, and then you're left only with the expectation of n, which is what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this part here is, uh, is what we will be studying, bless you, is what we will be studying in the next presentation. So I'll just uh, skip it. Right now, I'll just uh, skip this. Uh, now, the, the, the main part in here is that I'd like you to take a look at, uh, at this funny looking distribution because it has uh, this continuous part and it also has a mass point in here, just left alone in there, okay? Now, it is very important for you to observe that uh, what you have in here what you have in here is a weighted sum of distributions, a weighted sum of distributions. I mean, this thing here, it is a distribution, a distribution function, you see? I mean, of course the random variable is uh, rather crazy looking, like, oh, but it's still a random variable. So in here you can, you can say, you can have say the probability that Y is lower or equal than S, say that this thing here is Y, you see? So the probability that y is lower or equal than s. So that's just the distribution of y. And of course, this y depends on who n is. And then you weight, you weight that distribution function with this special weighting function called mass function of n. Now, what you have in here in mathematics is just called a convex combination. Convex combination is a linear combination, right? It's a linear combination of, in this case, uh, distribution functions. It is a linear combination of distribution functions, but, but the coefficients are all uh, greater or equal than zero and lower or equal to one, right? And, uh, and they always add up to one. 
So in mathematics, they're just called convex combinations. And uh, well, also in operations research, they're called uh, convex combinations. But in the context of probability theory, they are called mixtures. Okay, examples. Say that uh, we go back all the way to example 1.4. Example 1.4 says, a person might lose his job with the probability of 10%. And when this happens, the loss rises to 5,000 pesos. The thing here is that the loss is fixed at some level when it happens, when the loss happens. I want you to tell me how you use the model of collective risks in order to set the statement for this particular exercise. Now in here, in here, okay, the, the solutions are already provided in here. So uh, I, I'll just ask you to, to please help me to justify these answers. So the question is, what model would you use uh, for each of the following situations? First, a group of workers with different gender age and death benefit. So the answer is supposed to be the model of individual risks because they are different between each other, right? They're different to each other. Uh, okay. It says that uh, a reinsurance contract paying medical malpractices exceeding a certain amount is supposed to be modeled with the model of collective risks. How many contracts? And the amount is the same for all of them. See, so? A dental plan for a person who goes from uh, who goes to the dentist twice a year. Each contract covers families of different sizes at the same price. It says that you should use the model of collective risks. Now, in here we have something which is different to what we had in this in these first two uh, exercises, right? Because it was uh, fairly clear that we had different. <coughs> persons. Now, it was very clear that we had uh, the same certain amount as a deductible. But in here, it says that the families are of different sizes. So uh, shouldn't we use, I mean, isn't this an error? Shouldn't this be the model of individual risks? Is the size of the family a factor in here? It is not a factor. What is the thing that matters here? It is the same price for everyone. Yes, they all go twice a year. So in this case, we have that the frequency is uh, something that models the fact that they go twice a year. You see? So the size of the family is not important. Actually, what we could say in that case is that the severity of the model is given precisely by the size. But since we're not being told anything about the size, but that they're different, these sizes, that these sizes are different to each other. Then we could just uh, have a random variable that amounts precisely for uh, how much each family spends in the dentist. You see, uh, I will give you three advantages of using the model of individual risks. And then I will state the three advantages of using the model of collective risks. Its hypotheses are general enough. Its use is straightforward and can be implemented with fairly reasonable resources. And it amounts for the features of an heterogeneous group with common things means and barriers. Great. What does that mean? Uh, fairly reasonable resources. What what does that mean? I mean, you, you can you can use to the end of modeling things with uh, the model of individual risks. You should be able to to use a resource which is reasonable. Now, to what resource we refer here? So, fairly reasonable resources. What does that mean? What is fairly reasonable these days? What is the thing that everybody has access to? What, what kind of technology? R? Python? Excel, precisely. I mean, the, the only thing we, we've been using so far is Excel. So, yeah, using Excel. So, that's, that's precisely what this means. Yes, it amounts for the features of a heterogeneous group with common finite mean and variance. So please, please mind this hypothesis. Heterogeneous group, common and finite mean and variance. All right, now 
As for the model of collective risks. It is easy to model losses from data with many policy features. Great, thank you. Okay. Many policy features. For instance, deductible, co-insurances, limits of, of losses. A house can suffer a random number of accidents in a period. The insurer pays 80% of the losses that exceed a 1,000 deductible with a maximum payment of 100,000 pesos. All the claims in excess of 50,000 pesos are reinsured. First, describe the total loss of the person before any payment takes place. Describe the total loss for the insurer before the payments, before the payment from the insurance. I am so sorry about that. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, to give you how it looks for the insurance company. And then I intend to ask you to, to do the same, but for the rest of the items. You see? So, so far, I have this big risk, this big risk. So it is an absolute, an absolutely great risk. And the original loss is what? If this number here is lower or equal than a thousand, then the loss is of zero. Now, otherwise, then we should see if the number is lower than what? 126,000, yes. Then the loss is given by 0.8 times this thing here minus 1,000, right? Otherwise, the loss is bounded there. So I just do this and then there. So as you can see, the first thousand entries are just of zero, but then it changes. So I'll complete this lesson with the insertion of a uh, dispersion plot. Oh, there. Ah, fantastic. So as you can see, in here it's just, uh, I mean, here there is a, a huge interval that goes all the way from zero to 1,000 here. And then it starts to increase, 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 and then it stops, okay? And then you have this. Now, so what did we do in this session? All we did was to state the advantages and the, dis and, and the, the advantages of the model of individual risks and also the advantages of the model of collective risks. We also stated the hypothesis behind the model of collective risks and the theorem that says what is the, uh, the theorem that says what is the expectation of the model of collective risks. And finally, we started to talk about one of the main advantages of the model of collective risks, which is that we can model insurance with several features. In this case, for instance, we had deductibles, coinsurance, limit of responsibility, several agents, 